My name is Tom Kobrick. I'm a managing director with Key Bank Capital Markets in the Public Finance Group. Um, in, that, in that role, uh, we specialize in underwriting uh, tax exempt and taxable municipal bonds for the benefit of municipal bond of uh, uh, digital infrastructure, primarily locally owned and operated, uh, publicly owned and operated uh, municipal bond uh, projects financed uh, through the capital markets. Earlier this morning, you heard from my colleague um, speaking about uh, public-private partnerships. So we, we run the full uh, gamut of uh, public sector financing at the bank. Um, we are the leading underwriter for digital infrastructure projects uh, in the country. We've financed uh, projects in Utah and in Montana, as well as in Indiana. And um, we appreciate the opportunity to, to introduce the panel today. Uh, next to me is Bill Baker. He is the CEO and owner of Nextlink, which is a rural broadband operator. To my left is Amir Nair. He's the Deputy Development Office uh, Director for Meridian. And they're a leader in digital infrastructure de uh, development in um, Europe, and they're actually expanding their efforts here in North America. Derek Farrell is the Assistant City Manager with Victoria, Texas, and Greg Conti is the Director of the, uh, the Texas Broadband Development Office. And so I would ask each one of them to introduce themselves uh, and briefly talk about their role with local governments in funding these projects. Bill? Sure, Bill Baker with uh, NextLink Internet. Uh, you know, we're headquartered up in North Texas and operate over eight states. We have about 80,000 uh, broadband subscribers, uh, almost exclusively in rural markets. And we actually formed one of the first P3 broadband projects in Texas back in 2017 uh, with the city of Hudson Oaks, uh, where the city fundamentally built the broadband, and then we came in behind them and leased it from them. Um, and I would say the, the driver behind that, not to put words in the city of Hudson Oaks, but ultimately none of Big Telco wanted to touch an overbuild in that market. And so the city just said, well, then we'll just do it ourselves and find an operator and we happen to be uh, three miles down the road. So it's a nice win-win fit for everybody. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Um, Amir Nairi from Meridian. Uh, we are an in, in international um, infrastructure fund uh, where we develop and invest in all sorts of, uh, of infrastructure projects, a lot of P3s um, in Texas, the North Town, uh, several sections of the North Town um, Highway and the LPJ Highway uh, in, uh, near Dallas. Um, we, uh, we, we've been around for about 15 years now. We manage over 15 billion dollars of equity investments into uh, into our projects and what sets us apart and which is the reason why we're able to invest in in digital infrastructure is that we are 25 year funds so we are not the type of investor that comes in and uh, builds or, or buys something and then sells in four or five years but really our, our view is uh, in order to have a true impact on a community uh, you have to be there for the long run and, and that's been able to sort of unlock for us, an ability to invest in places where, as Billy were saying, the telcos are not necessarily going. Um, and we started sort of our, our activities of looking at digital infrastructure in Europe, um, which about four or five years ago, you know, we're based in Paris, and I actually just moved from, from Paris to New York uh, three days ago to, to lead our activities in, in the North American market. But um, we started to look at, uh, at uh, the European market and saw a, a real opportunity to go into suburban areas, medium density zones, um, rural areas, and to sort of apply our DNA of long-term investment into these, into these markets and, and are now um, have a series of projects over here in North America, particularly in the States, uh, but also in Canada that we're excited to, to develop and I'll tell you a little bit more about here in, in a few minutes. Um, Greg Conti, I'm the director of the Broadband Development Office. Um, the office was created last legis legislative session um, by HB5. Um, the office's mission is essentially to close digital divide in Texas. Um, one of our main goals is provide, providing incentives for communities, providers, PVPs to come out and um, build greater access, particularly in rural areas as well. And we all know in Texas, lots of rural areas. 
Um, we'll talk about funding a little bit, but it's just a few of the things we're doing now as far as from a planning perspective. And, and for those who don't know, uh, the office is within the Comptroller's office. Comptroller is a statewide elected official. Um, and uh, one of the things we're undertaking right now is to do a listening tour across the state. We do 12 different stops, it's kicking off on Tuesday. And um, the idea of this listening tour is to roll up into a broadband, see my broadband planning when HB5 was going through the legislature. Um, the talking point was we're one of six states who don't have a broadband plan. So what's the plan? The plan will essentially be our strategy for closing digital divide in Texas. Again, access is certainly one of those components, but there's also, of course, digital literacy, devices, uh, and other areas as well, as far as you know, what creates that digital divide. And so we'll establish a broadband plan. We're going to stand up a competitive grant program using funding that's coming our way. And um, we'll also establish an availability map for the whole state of Texas. It's going to be a location fabric map, uh, each building, whether it's a home or a business. And it'll indicate on that map, does that address have access to broadband, that 25-3? Um, and you know, it might have other bells and whistles on it too, but that's going to be a central component of that map. That we'll have up by January 1. So. I'm Darren Farrell, I'm uh, an assistant city manager at the city of Victoria, so like many of your clients or many of the places that you live and work, uh, we are undergoing an effort to improve broadband capacity and connectivity. Um, the way we say it is we try to make uh, high-speed internet more available, affordable, and reliable in Victoria. To do that, we created a, a group called the Victoria Broadband Commission. Um, we as a city led that effort, but it included um, the offices of all of our elected officials, whether that's the U.S. Congressman, the state local uh, legislators, or also every public entity that had anything, any interest, any shared interest in, in broadband development, whether that was schools or the Education Service Center, uh, hospitals, public hospitals, um, the universities, UHV, uh, University of Michigan, Victoria, and Victoria College. Both participated, um, and then as well as the county, uh, you know, and other folks. And so, yeah, we released an RFP that sort of said, "Here's a blank canvas. Um, we we want to make broadband more available, affordable, and reliable. How can you help us?" We got 14 responses. We worked through that, and they ranged anywhere from, "Give us a whole bunch of millions of dollars, and we'll fix it," to, "We don't want anything, but we'll fix it." Right. And so, just get out of the way, kind of thing. And so we're now working through the development of some private networks that will be owned and operated by private companies, as well as uh, potentially public-private partnerships in, in that. Okay, so um, having sat on these panels for the better part of 15 years, uh, over the course of that time, I used to think, is the joke on me? Because uh, usually these discussions and these agenda items were usually right before cocktail hour or people would come into the session to charge their phone or answer the email or take an app. Yeah, today, as we emerge from COVID, um, and obviously we've had some worldwide, you know, catastrophic types of effects of that, but what we are seeing is a generation we're being challenged with in many different ways. One of those ways is the advancement of digital infrastructure. And so um, what I'd like to talk, uh, what I'd like to have the panelists talk a little bit about today is the approaches they're taking in each of their respective fields, because we do have a, a unique, a diverse uh, group of, of folks up here to talk about their particular roles. And so I'd like to really start with Derek to talk about you know, his experience at the local level, because that's what's really important to many of you. Um, the stakeholders, their involvement, the, 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 you know, the specifications of his project, Acknowledging that every project will be different and financing every one of those projects will be different. So Derek, if you wanted to lead off our conversation. Sure, so what we found um, first is that you know, every week there's a new headline about some community that's building fire with a home or some community that's doing a little while project or some community that's doing something different than another community. And we started asking ourselves, should we be doing it the way they're doing it? Right? But what we found is that if it were stormwater drainage projects, you'd be looking at that unique to the topography and the size and scale of that area, right? So we do the same thing with broadband, right? What's right in 
one community in South Texas may not be right in the community in Central Texas or North Texas or, or wherever, right? And so we started simply by assessing the needs of our community. Right? We did a survey. This is kind of funny, right? So our American Rescue Plan Act funds that came in, we had several million dollars given to the city of Victoria, and the council said, well, let's ask the community how they want to spend the money. So we put up a, sur a survey for three months, and we got 60 responses, right? Um, doing our broadband study and our feasibility study and conceptually planning it out, we put up a survey for two weeks for how can we improve your connectivity? What, tell us about your, your experience with, with internet. 948 responses in two weeks. So you ask people how to spend millions of dollars and then they, won't, they don't have any interest in that. Thing. You ask them how to fix their internet, everybody's filling it out, right? Um, and, and so that gave us a lot of good insight, right? And so we built a plan, we, had, we worked with an engineering firm that, that built a plan. Here, all was welcome to review our plans. Our website is victoriatx.gov slash broadband. Um, the RFP that we have, that we did is on there. Everything else is, is on there. Um, but ultimately, we kind of came down to finding a couple of things. One, that we should treat the solar program like economic, like a traditional economic growth project, right? In order, with all these cities doing all these broadband projects, providers could go anywhere they want to. So how do we make ourselves attractive to them in the same way we would if we were trying to attract a manufacturing plant, right? What do we do to make Victoria attractive to these, these providers? And then the other thing we found was that it's also not like a, uh, a traditional economic development project because it, the, the, the prospect is not exhaustible. It's, it's instead a network. So in fact, if we can draw an attractive provider, if we can and build a network in our community, it makes the next town over more likely to have something better, right? Our success makes someone else's success more likely, as opposed to traditional economic development where, oh, they got the warehouse, so you move on to the next thing, right? This is, this is actually something that truly, where regionalism makes all the sense in the world and working with the county, working with folks outside, um, it has been crucial to making us more attractive because people like, the provider we work with, like finding out that, oh, the school district's already on board, great. Oh, the University of the College are here, good, right? And it, uh, it works the same way for investors. We found that investors are, are truly interested in, in partnerships in terms of <coughs> there's money to be made in, in broadband um, and in the unique solution you come up with identifying your needs, finding a, a plausible solution, and then pitching it like a sales pitch or any kind of development project is, is what, what is working for us as well. Thank you. Um, you know, when we talk about these types of projects uh, at the local level, by and large, the experience has been, there's a lot of buy-in, right? There's buy-in from politicians and local leaders, economic development community members, uh, the citizens, a lot of the vendors, but when you start to talk about how you finance these, uh, there's a deer in the headlights look, and they look at me and they say, Tom, well, you're a banker, give me money. And it's, you know, I'm not an ATM, my kids think I am, but I'm not, certainly. But, you know, to that point, Bill, why don't you talk a little bit about um, your experience and perhaps some of the federal programs. I know one of your programs was involved with the RDOF uh, program. Can you talk a little bit about that? And you know, how, how much reliance should uh, entities put on federal funding as part of their I mean, capital stack? Uh, yeah, I mean, next link between the Connect America Fund program which kicked off in 2018 and the rural digital opportunities fund RDOF, uh, which the funding's just about to start we won just over a hundred million dollars of funding for broadband in texas uh, alone and about another 600 million throughout the central united states and that is one of the key elements you know that sort of the city of victoria is a great example i would say that there's not like one city limit that funding covers us having an obligation. It is truly rural countryside uh, of the unserved. And, and really, uh, you know, as we look holistically, we started Next Link in 2012. And, you know, quite frankly, the, the federal government was happy to fund copper wire. And that was the extent of broadband support in rural markets. And now we've got a, you know, uh, 40 plus billion dollars, it's going to go to a heck of a lot of broadband 
across the U.S. Uh, I don't want to put numbers in Greg's mouth, but he'll have a checkbook of around $2 billion, uh, give or take. Um, and there, there's going to be a lot of discussion over what's the right technology, uh, do we want to try and cover everyone, um, what's the best use, should it be private matching, and that's a lot of what the state of Texas is going to spend the next year on figuring out what are all the questions and what are all the answers to those questions. But, but ultimately, the, the federal government has learned, and I think we have, we have all, everyone in this room has learned uh, during the last few years that broadband is a critical aspect to life. Whether it's your personal life or your professional life, uh, without broadband, the quality of your life comes to a quick halt. And when you look at the, just in the state of Texas, you've got several million very poorly served, uh, honestly, even in some urban markets, to be quite frank with you. Uh, you know, you've seen a tremendous amount of private capital flow into fiber bills. I think in the state of Texas alone, you're, you've got announcements in the last year around Tyler Longview, Bryan, uh, Amarillo, Wichita Falls, you know, I'm sure we, I'm leaving a lot. We've had, we've fibered up cities like Venus, Las Passas, Hudson Oaks. Uh, we're working the smaller end of the scale, uh, letting the big boys take the big cities. Um, you know, but you've also got another dynamic that I, can't be overlooked when it comes to broadband in Texas, and that is the massive new home growth that's going on in the suburbs. Um, you know, we alone have a queue of over 100,000 new home neighborhoods um, that we are fibering up uh, between the Red River and Waco. Um, so, I mean, there, there's a tremendous amount of broadband activity and capital flowing into broadband, um, given our good, good gentleman from New York, uh, from the private markets, beyond just the federal markets as well. And, and I think there's, it's gonna be tremendously important for both the state of Texas, as well as the operators, to put that capital to use in a very intelligent way to serve the citizens of Texas. I think that's a good point, Bill. I mean, really, in the capital markets, we're, we're starting to see market acceptance by investors that this is an essential service, no different than water or public power. And so, you know, when we, we just marketed a $65 million bond deal, um, which basically is a standalone credit because to date, most bond deals that have been issued for digital infrastructure purposes have had some kind of a secondary pledge required by investors, whether it's a sales tax or a property tax or uh, special assessment areas were formed. In this instance, you know, we marketed a bond, you know, in a, in a time where there was no more clear example that digital infrastructure, access to high-speed internet is an essential service. It really is emerging as a, as a utility. Um, and one of the ways we market the bonds, you know, cute and not cute, was to say to some of the salespeople and the investors, you know, how could you do your job investing for mutual funds or for insurance companies from home if you didn't have access to high-speed internet? Their Bloomberg terminals aren't necessarily portable, but they can certainly log on to their Bloomberg terminals and execute their trades. And that was really a, a driving point in our, our marketing process. So the essentiality of broadband and digital infrastructure is emerging from COVID. And it's really, it, it really is at the forefront. And so to that, I would ask, um, I'd ask Amir to talk a little bit about how does, how does a firm like Meridian go about selecting a community to work with or a project to work with given there are so many projects out there right now um, and they're so unique uh, to, to, to earlier points that were made. Yeah, I think one is we, we look for, for communities that are unloved by the telcos, right? Because the telcos today are, what are they focused on? They're focused on big cities where there's high density so that they can have make the return on the capital as, as quickly as possible. And two, they're focused on uh, investing in 5G, right? 5G networks, which is mobile connectivity. Here we're talking more about fixed um, connectivity. So to us, uh, it's, it's, it's important to make sure that we go to places where, uh, you know, either there's been, there's no love or there's what we like to call FTTPR, which is fiber to the press release, right? So 
people going around saying, I'm going to connect you, and then three years later you show up and there's been you know, no shovels in the ground, no, no ducks in the pond, uh, uh, no fiber laid in the ducks. I think we like to go to places that are just sick and tired of hearing the same thing from Comcast, from uh, AT&T, from, from Verizon, saying, we'll, we'll get to you, we'll get to you, sooner or later, we'll get to you. And I think there's a lot of communities out there that, um, that, that, that are seeing, particularly after COVID, the, as you say, the essentiality of, uh, of investing in uh, digital connectivity and of making sure that people are able to, uh, to continue to grow, student kids are able to learn from school, people are able to work from home and not constantly worry about, sorry, what did you say? I, I, sorry, you cut out, I can't hear you. I think it's happened to a lot of us, right, in the last little while. So I think uh, we like to go to places like that, and, then, and, and so that creates, in a way, engagement on behalf of the public sector. And we're not necessarily, look, while we are a P3 investor historically, ironically, our, our, none of our digital infrastructure investments are P3s. They're just structured with the same discipline, but we're actually doing all the investment ourselves, and we're not asking for anything from the public sector other than engagement, other than making sure that we have right of way when we need it, other than making sure that if we do end up bringing in an ISP that is not known, that we have the support of the local authority um, to be able to market, to have them be really on our side, and that we are, that we're aligned to make sure that this is going to be a boring success. And, what's, and, and because of the fact that we are a 25 year fund, and that we've never sold an asset in the 16 years that we've been around, we've, we've never uh, recycled an asset out of our portfolio yet, we really do look at things and say, we don't need the take rates to be off the charts in the next three or four years. We need over time, steady build up, a steady ramp up of people on our network. And so we're not really looking for, you know, how could we flip out of this in four or five years uh, and we need the maximum amount of people to, to sign up, but rather uh, how can we enter into a community and be a true force uh, for change uh, and to make sure that we are helping bridge that, that digital divide. And, and part of the way that we do that is we commit to an authority when we go in that we will cover a certain percentage of the region. So we're not cherry picking the places where there's the wealthiest um, individual that can pay for broadband or where there's uh, the highest amount of density, but rather we're really sort of making a promise in them um, and saying we will cover a certain percentage. So in the, in, in, in the case of, uh, of one of our projects in the state of Indiana with the city of Bloomington, we have committed to covering at least 85% of the city, which uh, if, if some of you know, the uh, University of, uh, Indiana University is there, which is great. But on the flip side, there's about 20% of people that are that are living uh, that, that are low-income individuals, and so we have to find a way to ensure that our that uh, we're covering them. And by bringing in partners, not just the city, but also bringing in NGOs, uh, you know, we're working with the National Digital um, Inclusion Alliance uh, on on helping. Uh, educate the, the utility of broadband over the long term, and we're also bringing in foundation partners such as the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, who has a, a, a whole wing of, of digital um, uh, digital connectivity, digital uh, inclusion that they've been working on. So for us, it's really sort of thinking at looking at things holistically, and not just saying we're we're, we're, we're trenching holes in the ground and we're going to lay fiber and people are going to connect. But really, to make sure that this is a, a holistic investment that's that's really going to be having a, a, a serious impact on the community for a long, long time. Greg, um, given the skyrocketing price of materials, particularly fiber, uh, the limited availability of labor, and the you know pending policies around the federal funding that's coming. What would your guidance be in terms of working with your office and an update on the federal programs that are on this? For communities, local governments, those who are seeking to benefit from the funding that will go through our office, is obviously planning, having that asset assessment on the ground. Um, Tom, I don't know if your kids work for local governments, but we've had a lot of local governments contact us thinking we were ATM too. And the moment that we had, so one of the first buckets of money we received was from ARPA, one of the ARPA um, funding streams under the ARPA umbrella was the Coronavirus Capital Projects Fund. And that allotted Texas $500 million in uh, funding. Now, state offices, state broadband offices have been in place in other states before us. And they've been, um, you know, typically an annual funding stream might be 10, $20 million. So we're a brand new office, we just got a bucket of cash to get $500 million. 
And so we got all, once we had that, local governments were calling us and saying, hey, you're sitting on a bag of cash. Where's my bag of cash? What can I do? What do you, I have a battery net. What can I do? Like, what do I make with that money? And so our conversation always starts with, you know, um, what, are you, what, what are you doing on a local level to get yourself prepared for this funding? Um, you know, you talk about Victoria's Commission on Broadband. They've established stakeholders, they've established the broadband leader in the network, they've understood what their needs were, established goals, how they're going to get there. That's where local governments need to be, to be ready for this funding. You're not going to come in here as a local government or a community or a provider without that general assessment of who are you going to assist, what house, how number of households you're going to serve. We need to do all of these um, uh, data, collect all this data for because we will be reporting this information back up to whether it's Treasury through ARPA, whether it's NTIA through the IOJA bill. Um, so what, one of the things that we're doing is messaging that communities, local governments, ISPs, whatever it needs to be, need to be ready for the, uh, for the application process to, get, for, to receive any benefits from this funding at all. Um, so I talked about I, uh, the current rights capital projects fund, that's 500 million. What that one does is it really focuses on areas that have less than 120, 100 over 20. Um, and you know, it has some, uh, some treasury criteria in that as far as you know, work, health, and education components in that. Um, but it's looking at that 120, kind of that's where we need to sort, um, start targeting that funding for that. We as a state haven't stood that process up. Like I said before, we'll be getting to uh, stand up that competitive grant process. But we'll, when, before we even receive any funding, we'll need to talk to Treasury, develop a grant plan, and essentially how we're going to spend that fund. So a lot of that money is essentially going to go to a competitive grant process. We're also do have, we also have a uh, pole replacement program, which will be a reimbursement program for replacing utility poles and bring broadband to some of these unserved areas across the state. Um, and so we're looking at, again, we're developing rules for that and implementing those rules now, and we'll have that as part of that plan. So 75 million of that 500 million will go to that program as well. So again, pole replacement will certainly be part of a uh, broadband expansion strategy. <clears throat> and then lastly, as I talked about IIJA, the infrastructure bill, there'll be two components in that bill that will be state administered. Um, we're talking about the $42 billion, the BEATS program itself. Um, that money will come through Texas. Um, we are waiting on FCC, new FCC broadband maps, which will look to where the unserved, underserved, high cost areas of the state. And once we have a better idea of what those look like, that process is formulaic and that will dictate how much Texas will receive. As Bill was alluding to, we're hearing somewhere between the one and three billion dollars. Um, it's a lot of money. So, and then we have five years to spend that. So, pressure three, yeah, right. one yeah. and three. <laughs> so, um, part of that process too is for us to come back. So we're developing a state broadband plan now. State broadband plan is just for the state to get an idea of kind of what's going on in the state and sort of strategize. And GIA requires us to establish a five-year plan. So we're going to the state broadband plan. We're going to do some more planning. We're going to establish a five-year plan on how best to serve uh, the state of Texas. The way that NTIA has structured this, or the way that um, our leaders in Congress have structured this, is that we have to submit a five-year plan before we know where the unserved and underserved areas are, before we know how much money we're receiving. It's kind of like running a grocery list before you know how much you want to spend and what you're going to make. But, um, so once we do that, and we'll have a better idea of how much funding we're going to receive, and then we'll, again, roll that into the grant process that we already have up in place that we'll be getting the ARPA funding up. Um, and so we'll have a five-year burn rate on that, too. The ARPA funding needs to be spent by December 2026. Again, that's why the importance of these projects being shovel ready, um, and why when, when you get this funding, all the money needs to be expended by December 2026 for the ARPA. Um, and then, so we talked about beads, 42 billion, and then we talked about digital equity, there's a digital equity component, you know, making sure we're closing the digital divide in those underserved uh, communities, whether it's digital literacy programs, devices, things like that. And so we'll be, again, five-year plan, now we're looking at a digital equity plan, a state plan for digital equity, and how we're gonna implement those programs and stuff. So, and that will give, back of the envelope, Texas will receive anywhere between 70 and 100 million dollars for digital equity programs, um, and, Will be that will be a competitive that will be a competitive grant process that will be more of a, um, a, a how do we fund programs that will get those that uh, those programs out into the public. We develop partnerships with our state libraries who are doing digital literacy and other partners as well, and uh, so we'll 
be continuing to develop those plans and not. So more to come. If, if, can I just sort of jump in? Because I think we're, we're talking today a lot about sort of all this, all this, all these grants and all these subsidies that are available. I think it's important to remember that the taps will stop at some point, and the importance here is to make sure that the programs that are funded are sustainable and are and, and go beyond sort of the next four or five years because. Uh, I think it, it's easy to spend it, it's harder to invest it, right? And so I think um, I would urge you and, and sort of everybody who's sitting in your seat, uh, you know, in the different offices around, around, um, around the states, is to, and, and the public authorities to also think about sort of how do you take this money that's available today and make sure that it's catalytic uh, and that there's sort of generational impact that's happening. Uh, and not just sort of, um, you know, a way to say, okay, well, we, you know, we spent it, so we must have done good, because at some point those tabs will turn off, and uh, you know, and I think it'll be, uh, you know, the, 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 there's a there's a really big opportunity, but it, it also comes with a lot of um, a lot of risks if, if it's not sort of invested correctly. Yeah, those are those are definitely great takeaways. Um, the takeaways I'll offer, and then before we open up to questions, I'll ask each of the other panelists to offer their takeaways, but. You know, my takeaway, my takeaways that I offer are, you know, don't wait. Put your team together. Um, put your planning for your network on a parallel path with putting together your financing package, because that financing package will be very different than than any other project that's out there. It, it might be composed of municipal bonds. If if they are, then give me a call, um, or a private partner, or certainly federal funding. But what that looks like will be very different based on your own project and your individual project. Um, and so that would be my parting advice would be, don't wait. Fiber is getting more expensive, labor is becoming more in demand, uh, and your constituents and stakeholders will want to take part in this essential service going forward. Bill? Yeah, I would add, just for, for clarity for everybody in the room who's not living and breathing in the broadband world, there are distinct markets, and there are the urban, suburban markets that you may not love your internet service, but you're probably getting 100 megs, and that's not gonna trigger a governmental grant. It's gonna be above that threshold that Greg referred to. But those markets still are receiving a tremendous amount of private capital investment from operators who are building fiber networks using completely private capital. Mm -hmm. And then there's the rural countryside that doesn't meet the, the high-speed the high broadband definition of 100 by 20. And that's really sort of a government subsidized, not fully funded, but I would say subsidized approach. And you've got, and that's where there's all these different funding mechanisms. And so, you know, I don't know the intimate details of, of how Victoria and the county and the city handled their broadband needs. But in terms of how these things are funding and how they're coming together, they are very distinctly different channels of, of capital that are both flowing very heavily into broadband. I think that's a, a critical component. So as you think about maybe an, an urban market that you're unhappy with the broadband in your community, you know, it's, it's really looking at the, the lowest hanging fruit or the telcos that are there now and upgrading their plan. If not, it's talking to operators who aren't there and who have the capital to come in and do an overbuild that quite frankly is happening in a lot of communities in Texas today. Eric? Well, I absolutely agree. Victoria's kind of in that, in that area where we're covered, right? According to all the standards and everything else. But none of the measures measure how well does it work? How often does it work? Right, and and so quality of service is a thing, right? It is, and I, so I actually just met with my my own provider this week because you know we have some other projects, some middle mile type projects, and I literally invited them to say, hey, listen, between last Friday and Tuesday of this week, I've had internet two hours a day, every day, and so I know you need upgrades to your infrastructure. You should you should probably join in on this, right? And and so we've had. We had those conversations, right? And then you know, some of the points that, that Greg and Mir made um, in, our, in our communities where we're able to do it now with funding that's available now, 
I borrowed a quote in a whole bunch of meetings from Albert Einstein where he said you can't solve your present problems using the thinking that was used when we were created. And so we have to be thinking about what's coming next, right? You just heard a presentation earlier on autonomous buses, right? It's got to be more than making the internet at my house work. It's got to be solving for future problems because in solving those, we'll also solve the problems we, we experience today. Um, yeah, so 7 million Texans and 3 million homes don't have access to broadband for various reasons. A lot of those are kids, they can't log on to education. A lot of them are sick, they can't do telehealth. A lot of them are businesses who can't participate you know, fully in the, in the uh, local economy. And so we, you know, like you were talking about, this is once in a lifetime infusion of federal money to solve this issue. Um, my goal is to close the divide. My goal is to work myself out of a job. And um, if I'm still employed here in six years, I did something wrong, so. <laughs> I don't know if you got any questions or if we should as well. There's I, one question over there. I don't have a question as well. Oh, Sorry about that, just one second. I'll just start. Um, in reference to the rule of market, uh, is there any thought from, uh, is there any thought from uh, the uh, um, panel in reference to uh, supporting the rule uh, need? Uh, along the lines of co-op, similar to uh, what the uh, electric utility did in order to bring service to the same market that uh, you're talking about there. Do you want to take that, Greg? Yeah. Um, I think there are about the nine ECs in Texas that are in the broadband game right now. There's some more who are looking to get into the game. Um, and if we're following, you know, since we'll be utilizing ARPA and IJ funding, um, the way that that guidance is written is we need to prioritize entities like co-ops who are not profit driven or community based for these projects as well. So we're working with Texas um, Electric Co-op, we're working with the local co-ops themselves, um, one for the infrastructure, but also two for pole replacement and things like that. And so there's, still, there's, there's certainly a key stakeholder in this um, in this submission as well as closing digital divide. Well, and I would add as well to that, we at NextLink work very closely with a lot of electric co-ops who, you know, at, at, at their core, they care about their members and, and their membership area. And so we certainly have numerous partnerships with electric co-ops who want to do what they can to bring in broadband without necessarily jumping in the deep end of the pool, uh, investing the millions of dollars it takes for the infrastructure and, and getting into a new business line. So you know, Texas and other states, we have a variety of different kinds of partnerships where it could be utilizing electric poles uh, that, are, that are in the co-op. It could be letting them, in, in one case, we actually built across 28 substations in rural markets, our tower network, and now they hang all of their automated meter reading gear on our towers to reach their members and just and save them from building 28 towers themselves. So trying to find ways where we can leverage that telecom infrastructure, you know, for the benefit of not only the, the broadband customers, but also the, the co-op and their operations. Yeah, question. Yeah, thank, thank you. I got you. Yeah, um, you mentioned uh, economic uh, development, and my, my name's Helen Callie with Brad Link. Brad Link, uh, I own Texas. Um, you mentioned uh, economic development, you also mentioned uh, labor shortage. Um, in, in many of the rural communities, in many of the urban areas, there are is pretty much double-digit unemployment for for some some folks there. Can you speak to uh, can you speak to the training that comes along with the funding? Can you speak to uh, jobs creation that comes along with that as well? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we're looking at ways that we can best spend these funds. We've had several um, entities approach us about job training for. Um, uh, for telecommunications and things like that. Uh, and we're looking at what other states are doing. I know Vermont's putting together a uh, training program working with um, their community colleges, and we're looking to see maybe if that's something that can fit within our portfolio right now. But the things that we're focusing on is setting up that grant program and developing a plan and all of that as well. And maybe that's something that gets fleshed out through that planning process that you know the workforce just isn't there yet, and we just don't have. The funding doesn't match the workforce availability. And so there's no way that we can spend that, that funding because, again, referring back to 
the actual uh, guidance on this funding, we need to prioritize local local uh, 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 workforces with, within these projects. So that's something that we'll be looking at. It's kind of where this workforce is coming from. Um, and so certainly in Texas, that's something that we're thinking about. Kind of if we don't have the people to do it and we have a timeline to spend it, um, that, that's going to be a problem. So. Are, are you open to looking at other ideas? Oh, of course, yeah. Okay, let's, let's chat before you leave. Okay. Uh, Mr. Nick Link, and then I'd like to hear from Victoria as well. Thank you uh, so much. I appreciate it. Well, well, certainly, and I love that title, Mr. Next <laughs> um, You know, I, I mean, just at, at our own organizations, we've grown to build out our service area. I mean, we've hired and trained over 500 people in the last 18 months alone uh, in the middle of the pandemic. So that was interesting to say the least. But we actually work when it comes to uh, digital li literacy. We're actually partnered with Microsoft who is, you know, obviously is a very large motivation to get people literate in using computers in Microsoft Office. Um, so, and we're one of the largest providers of internet service to school districts in Texas. So we're, we're working very closely with school districts, Microsoft, and, you know, as, as participant in the affordable connectivity program and the $30 discount, we also provide discounted devices uh, as well to those that qualify. So. We're sort of coming at it from a variety of different ways, some of which were motivated by, by our own hiring needs. Uh, and some of it is just also somewhat responsive to the communities that reach out to us, right? I mean, because I, I think we've heard some references to it. There's a lot of communities calling out for different kinds of needs, whether it's infrastructure, digital training, labor skills, those things. And quite frankly, there's more crying than there is capacity. So we, we almost respond to, if you will, the, the loudest voice in the room uh, at the time. We just got waved. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.